So, we are good to go very soon. Welcome, my dear audience and friends, to Cancer Convos with Grace B. This is your host, Grace B, coming to you from New York City, the city that never sleeps and is home to Cancer Convos with Grace B. I'd like to thank you guys ever so much for your continued support on my platforms. For the newbies, this show aims to demystify the cancer disease and to bring experts and stakeholders in the cancer space to come give their take. It's Cancer Screening Week, and don't forget to do your screens. And as we all know, until there's a cure, prevention is the cure. Now, as a breast cancer survivor, I constantly come across um, female cancer patients of childbearing age who have not unfortunately had children before their cancer diagnosis and uh, regret not having the opportunity or not having available information as regards fertility options. Now, this breaks my heart. Being a mother myself, um, I had to invite a very um, fantastic man with a great mind um, to come give um, evidence-based insights uh, through this uh, very complex uh, situation. My next guest will guide us through this. Um, he is a Nigerian obstetrician and gynecologist and the managing director of Nordica Fertility Center, Lagos, Nigeria, which specializes in IVF, which is in vitro fertilization and treatment of infertility. He is a passionate infertility expert who has written countless medical articles and a philanthropist. If I had to list all his achievements, believe me, we would be here for a very long time. Therefore, without much ado, let me welcome Dr. Abayo Miyajai to the show. Welcome, Dr. Jai. I'm so, so, so honored to have you with me. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much, Grace, and uh, thank you for the wonderful intro. Thank you, sir. So please, sir, I know, you know, that intro was too brief. Please um, go ahead and tell us about yourself, um, you know, childhood, school, family. Okay, yeah, yeah. thanks. Um, yes, um, I was born in Lagos um, about... Uh, 59 years ago, and um, I attended CMS Grammar School here in Lagos, and um, for my medical degree, I, I, my first degree was in the University of Lagos, and then I did my postgraduate uh, training at the University College of Pulibado. And uh, since then, I worked in, uh, I worked in Laguna Hospital when I became a gynecologist, and then I set up Nordica Fertility Center in 2003. And so that's, uh, yeah, family, okay. Um, I have four children and uh, I'm expecting my fourth grandchild. Oh, and, nice. uh, <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. So yeah, that's, that's the bit and pieces of it. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> That's fantastic. Dr. Jai, as MD CEO of Nordica Fertility Center, um, which happens to be a very, very reputable um, fertility center, I would also love to congratulate you on your amazing milestones, um, bringing smiles to the faces of families um, over the births of so many um, children, beautiful children. So your remarkable institution has brought smiles to those who had lost hope of ever having a child. So before we delve deep into what you do and all that um, at the center, please um, explain to us exactly what infertility is and what causes this medical condition, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, infertility is the inability of a couple to conceive or have a live pregnancy a baby after one year of trying. Um, there are four major reasons why this could happen. 
either the man, which we call male factor, or the woman, which we call the female factor, or the two of them together, which we call combined factors. And then there's a small group, which is about, uh, depends on the environment, between 10 to 20% of the time, which we call the unexplained factor. What this means is that after doing the common test for infertility, we can still not find out why this couple is unable to have children. Now, what I tell my patients most of the time is that doctors don't treat test results, okay? Even if the test result says there is no reason. But this couple have been trying for two, three years, then there is, there is a reason which your test results probably cannot find. And so they belong to that unexplained group. Of course, if we do some other very um, fine tests, you might be able to find some of the means. But well, sometimes it's, we ask ourselves, except for research purposes, why do you want to do those tests? Okay, because they don't add to your treatment of the of the couple. So yeah, but uh, we, so that's where the unexplained group comes in. Okay, sir. So um, how long does one have to wait? You said two, three years. So many people or couples that I've, I've seen and read about have actually gone on to wait for, for much longer before seeking intervention in this regard. But from your medical perspective, how long do you think a couple should wait before seeking um, help in that regard? Actually, um, another wonderful question. Um, we, you, we don't even have the luxury of two to three years. Actually, you know, when you asked me what infertility is, I said mm -hmm. it's the inability to have a child but after, so actually it's one year if you are less than 35. But if you are over 35, especially the woman, if she's over 35, then six months, is the, after six months, you should start knocking on doctor's doors to be able to find out is there any problem? Because we know that infertility also is dependent on the age mm. of the couple, but more especially of the woman. Mm. So, um, so once after one year of trying, uh, when we say you have been trying, that means you are having two to three uh, intercourse in a week, mm -hmm. unprotected intercourse in a week, mm -hmm. then you should be seeing the doctor. Okay. Oh, wow. That, that's fantastic um, advice there. So um, now back to what you actually do um, at the uh, fertility uh, center. What is... IVF. And could you please walk us down this process, please? Thank you. Yes, I will. Um, IVF, like you said in your intro, means in vitro fertilization, which means fertilization taking place outside the body. Okay. Um, this method was uh, the first successful one was in 1978. And, um, yeah, and uh, since then, millions of babies have been uh, gotten through that the process of in vitro fertilization. Now, the process uh, involves when you have done your investigations and then you have seen that, okay, the best way to treat this couple is through IVF. Then there are probably four or five method, uh, steps involved. Mm -hmm. Okay, Then that's the first thing is that um, we need, a woman normally will produce one egg in a month, mm -hmm. but it's not only one egg that started the journey. But there is, a, there is a process in the body that makes only one leg to come out to maturity. So the first thing we need to do is to suspend that system in the body with a drug and then so that we can recruit more eggs in, this, in that cycle. So the first drug suppresses that uh, process of making only one egg to mature. The second drug now stimulates as many eggs as, as possible to be recruited into that cycle because it's only, we cannot deal with one one egg, egg. as many eggs as possible. So now we now start monitoring these eggs through the scan, we, the, the ultrasound scan, and then once we see that they're mature, then we have a trigger, trigger injection, which we give to make the eggs to mature. But before the body throws them out, then we have to go there to pick up the eggs. So the second process, after using the drugs to mature the eggs, to, and then you have triggered the, the eggs, is to go and pick them up in, in the laboratory. Now, 
this pickup is not a surgery as in surgery as in cutting you open. It's they, there's this needle that is, can be attached to the probe of the ultrasound scan. This scan is done through the vagina and then we can put the needle through it and then we can see the follicles which contain the eggs and then bring them out through the vagina. It takes about 10-15 minutes and then we are, we are through. The moment we brought out the, the eggs, we must not give them to the embryologist. This is a scientist that is training, looking after the uh, eggs and the sperm. Mm -hmm. We now, in the laboratory, combine the sperm and the eggs together. Now, depending on the, the parameters, the sperm parameters, we dictate what the embryologist is going to use to bring the sperm and the eggs together. If the sperm parameters are up to par, then the embryologist can do what we call the conventional idea, which is like boy meets girl in the laboratory. Mm -hmm. the, the sperm and the egg will have a way of talking together. Mm -hmm. But if the sperm parameters are so par, then the embryologist does what we call ICSI or intracytosplasmy sperm injection. Now, what that means is just that the embryologist will identify one sperm and inject it into the egg. Okay. That's what we call ICSI. So, depending on what the sperm parameters are like, then we determine what is the best way to bring the sperm and the eggs together. So, what we're just doing in actual fact is what nature does bringing sperm and eggs together. And now we must do it in such a way, though we're doing it outside the body, that it must mimic the conditions in the body. So the incubator where we're going to put the sperm and the egg to mix is set at body uh, temperature and carbon dioxide, you know, okay. so the, which is like in the body. So, and once we do this, the egg will start, will continue to grow. The fertilization. After fertilization, the egg will start splitting or dividing into uh, parts. And uh, so, uh, with the embryologist, will start looking at this and see that they're progressing normally. So, you can do your transfer diet on the three or the five. All right. And mm -hmm. so, and also, so now we can even decide not to transfer in that cycle. We can keep and then to transfer at a later date, depends on. Uh, so. But after your transfer, you now wait for two weeks in order for you to do a pregnancy test. And that's where you know whether uh, you have succeeded or you have not. So, Dr. Jai, when you talk about transfer, that is transferring the already fused um, embryo. embryo back yeah. into the body of the lady, right? That's right. Oh, that's wow. Right. That, that is something. That is something. All based on the what should I say, temperature, body temperature and everything. So, sure. what, so what could go wrong during this time is um, if the embryo does not ripen or grow to, what, what, what are those instances that could make it not be successful? Okay. Um, many things could go wrong during this process if you look at it from the point of view. Um, the, for example, you, the woman might not produce enough eggs. Okay. All right. Um, and um, or she might even have no eggs at all. That's why we always the counseling is very important. Before before I spoke to you, now I was just talking to uh, a couple. The woman is forty-eight years old. She wants to lose her eggs. All right. So it, it's that kind of situation. You might end up having no eggs at all. And that will, the, the process will stop at that stage. Right? Mm -hmm. But sometimes even you get the egg, you get the sperm, uh, because either the egg is not very good, the, the greatest reason why that might be so is age. Right? If that, the commonest reason why that might be so is age. So if it's not very good, and then the sperm cannot fertilize it, or it fertilizes and then it dies prematurely, there is nothing for it to transfer. That's also a possibility. And the process also stops at that point in time. So, but if um, we expect, if everything is working out well, we expect that about 70 to 80% of the eggs that we, we bring to the laboratory will fertilize. Okay. okay. Right. So, but um, now the, 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 pro the biggest problem we have where things really go wrong is after your transfer, 
that the body now only takes about maybe about 40% of what you have transferred to it. So, um, and that's, so the, the failure really and truly, the rate limiting process in IVF is the, what we call implantation, okay, which we actually refer to as the black box of reproduction because we know very little about what is happening at this stage because it's like uh, uh, you planted uh, a, a maize, you can't go there to scratch to see whether it's going or not. You have to wait for it to sprout. Mm -hmm. And so that's what the two weeks is all about. We wait for it to sprout and then see whether we have succeeded or we have, we have not succeeded. Okay, Doctor. That's so interesting, you know, uh, the, the way you've actually explained it. I mean, I've, I've read about it and all that, but you've really taken time to really explain all these questions that um, I had wanted to ask. Now, I know every woman is de desirous of having, you know, uh, children and all that, but I do um, read in certain uh, places that um, not every woman is considered a candidate. What does this mean? Well, you see, um, reproduction has two phases. There is the fertilization and then there is the implantation. Okay. Um, sometimes you can see from the get-go that, uh, for example, if a woman is no longer producing eggs, just like you said, okay, there is nothing for you to do. Mm -hmm. um, so, but of course, such a woman can use donor eggs, right? So it's not no, no, no for such a patient. Okay. Yes. But most of the time, the problem is with the implantation, where the woman's uh, uh, systems how interact with the embryo. Okay. For example, for a woman who we know that, for example, has cardiac. Uh, uh, conditions that are severe, you might not want such a person to be a pregnant. Okay. On control hypertension, on control diabetes, they might not just be people to that you want. Or she's had repeated surgeries that we see that uh, the uterus it's not really uh, very good to be able to uh, encourage implantation. Mm. You know, we try to do what we call the stereoscopy that's looking inside the uterus and you see that the whole place is scarred, especially in our environment, where we see that many people, up to about 80% of women by age 50 will have fibroids in different shapes and sizes. So that might just, and some, of, some women have had three attempts at surgery, I mean, you know, for fibroids. Some of them have ended up with horrible scars, not outside, but inside the, the uterus. You know. So such people also might, it might be difficult for them to be able to do IVF. So, but also, there is always something for everybody. So it does such people can do surrogacy. Also, another woman can carry the baby for them. So they are yes. different things, they are different, and necessity is just the mother of invention. It's, it's so true. You know? Yes. Yeah. So because of the conditions that we come across, we have been able to uh, get so many methods in that could help and uh, uh, also for some people you know um, I'm sure you know that that now it's possible to do some genetic screening mm -hmm. for, for some aspects of breast cancer yes sir yes. so it's possible also to do that and you can do that to the um, up to the embryo level where you can choose embryos that yeah. don't have uh, antigen so it, there's so many possibilities now that we Yes, indeed. I mean, um, those um, instances that we, we would have given up hope for, we now see that there are openings, you know, clinical trials are occurring every day, uh, research is going on and um, really opens up the space for, for things like this. Interesting. Int so how long does this IVF process um, take, actually? Yeah, uh, well, it depends on the kind of treatment that one is doing and the protocol that has been employed. But generally, about two to four weeks. So, it depends, yeah, it depends on the kind of treatment you're doing. But uh, generally, about two to four weeks. So, what are the things that if I um, was seeking, uh, uh, an, uh, you know, fertility treatment and all that, what are the things that you'd advise me to? not to do or to do first of all let's uh, what what would you advise me to avoid doing before embarking on an ivf treatment 
Yeah, great question. Um, I think what everybody agrees on is the uh, probably the uh, influence of stress on your outcome. Okay, so probably things that just live your healthy normal life. Uh, your body mass uh, uh, body mass index should be as near to normal as possible. Okay, so that means your diet. You need to avoid uh, alcohol. I mean, excessive alcohol. If you are smoking, please try to stop. And this time, no uh, recreational drugs, you know. Such are the things that just to help, uh, lead a healthy lifestyle and the, your balanced diet. Uh, those are the things that we we'll just encourage you to do. But uh, really and truly, it's just living a healthy lifestyle. So, yes, people talk about diet, there is neither here nor there. Is Mediterranean diet. Well, it, I think it's still all part of living a healthier lifestyle. Okay, uh, because you know most of the things about diet and no diet is usually um, uh, most of the time is not uh, uh, evidence based per se. Mm -hmm. It can be difficult to talk about diet. Yeah, but some people talk about also pineapple, taking pineapple when you're doing the process. But stress is one thing that everybody agrees on. Yes. That's why yeah, some people are putting some ancillary treatments like uh, uh, acupuncture, you know, to help when you're doing the treatment. Mm. So that all to just in the bit to help you to relax. Yeah. So like, I think that's you can't go wrong with relaxation. Yes, especially when, you know, you're, the, the lady is anxious, uh, you know, the, the couple is anxious. Uh, there's no way stress or anxiety will not be part of the mix, you know. I would be because you're like, oh, my God, is it going to work? Is it not going to work? Uh, blah, 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 you know. So um, you're talking about the woman now, uh, the things that she must avoid. What about her partner, her spouse? Are there things that he should also avoid doing? Yeah, almost the same thing for the spouse. Because don't forget that reproduction or even IVF, which is reproduction also, is bringing the sperm and the eggs together. So if you have beautiful eggs, you have ugly sperm, you're going to get an, end up with an ugly embryo. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, so, so that, those are, and that's one of the problems we're having now because a lot of guys on some funny things, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that's also affecting our results. Mm -hmm. So you, it's one of the things we tell them. And sometimes they don't volunteer this history. It's only when you have a failure that the wife comes to you and says, you know that my husband is doing this, he's doing that. And then, so it, it's one of the things that we need to get out there. That if you, it's one of the sacrifices you might need to make when you have this, this treatment. So uh, just before you start having the treatment, for the sake of even the baby or babies that you're going to produce. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic. So um, before this process starts, I take it that you would have called both, you know, husband and wife or, you know, the couple to sit down and have um, uh, a deep, in-depth conversation about what they have to do, um, counsel them before time. Um, so that they do understand that this this is not just about you being the doctor so that they don't blame you. It also has to do with them um, also committing to the cause. You know, there is no part of medicine where the patient is involved as in reproductive medicine, you know, uh, because um, what we say to our patients that we, we are not with them 24 hours of the day. Mm -hmm. So we they need to understand some of the things. Okay, for example, they need to know when things are going wrong and when things are going the way they should go. So it's and so counseling is a very important aspect of so we, apart from the doctor counseling them, we have fertility counselors. Some of our clinics also have fertility coaches, you know. So nice. that the, yeah, we know that you need to be in the group for yeah. us to be successful. With this, apart from having uh, acupuncturists, uh, some of us also do that. So it, it, the idea is that we want, and you know, we in this environment, especially, 
we don't talk so much. We, mm -hmm. we talk about things that are not important, but the very important things, we, we don't talk so much about them. We think they are private or whatever. So it's like you need to try to get things out of these people in order for them to be able to succeed in the endeavor that they Many people just come to the fertility clinic, especially in this part of the world, not even understanding what the process is all about. They, they all, all they just want is that I want a baby. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, it doesn't work that way. You need to know the technology. You need to note, know the limitations of the technology. Because it's like you, I want to come to the States now, and I go and buy a car. Mm -hmm. Okay? Well, the money I should go and buy used to buy a flight ticket. If I yeah. buy a car, it's going to take me one year to get to, <laughs> so, yes. to, get to the States. So you need to know the technology that is appropriate for the mm. problem that you have to start so, and that's one of the things that why counseling is really very, very important. Um, but you know, again, in, in this part of the world, uh, religion is also a big factor. Yes. So most of the time, the people are not even listening to you. And when you say something, they say, it's not my portion. Yes, yes. And, Honestly. <laughs> um, um, I, I talk about that all the time. Religion and culture. Culture. Yeah. Yeah. You're not supposed to talk. You're not supposed to say anything. But this is my body. I should have a exactly. say. I should ask yeah. questions. You should ask questions, and rightly so. Yeah, so that's the, what we're trying to get people to understand now. Mm -hmm. you, know, you can't just sit in front of me and tell me that, oh, doctor, you, know, you are the one who knows the best. No, I said, no. Now, in this case, it's your body we're talking about. And therefore, you need to be part of the decision making. You need to make the decision. I'm just part of the decision making. I'm supposed to help you in arriving at a decision that is, you think is uh, you are comfortable with. Exactly. Exactly. Wow. This is um, very interesting. Thank you so much, Dr. Jai. Now, this pr procedure, I, I, I know a couple of people that have done it and have, you know, ended up having triplets and quadruplets and all that does this ivf procedure is it's is it actually that it increases the chances of having multiple births i mean oh, embryos oh, yes uh but, but you know it's uh, that's actually i know in africa we like multiple births okay mm. but it's actually a uh, mixed blessings because we know that when you have more than one baby in the uterus, the chance of complications is higher, all right? Uh, and therefore, yes, before, up to about 25% of babies mm -hmm. come from IVF used to be more than one. Mm -hmm. But that is reducing worldwide now. Because even in some countries now, uh, it's made compulsory that you can only transfer one embryo, all right? So because before, we were transferring many embryos. And the, sometimes uh, the story is told of some people who have transferred six embryos in the past, many years ago. Wow. Six. Probably before, before Abraham. <laughs> 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 wow, that's a lot. Oh. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But even it's happened in America. Yes, you know? I know. So, uh, Seven, yeah, ten. But now, yeah, exactly. But now everybody's going, we know that the, the, the technology works. We yeah. know that we can, yeah. And therefore, there's no point in trying to transfer so many embryos anymore. So majority will transfer not more than two embryos now. So that has reduced uh, the incidence of multiple pregnancies. But it's still more, the idea predisposes you more to multiples than natural birth. There's still no doubt about that. Because even sometimes you transfer one, is rarely it, it happens that wants to listen to two, two babies. So sometimes that also can happen. So yes, it, uh, there's the risk, the multiple pregnancy is one of the risks of IVF. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. We, we, we will note that down. <laughs> so as you, as, as you know, I'm, um, I'm a breast cancer survivor. Um, luckily, I'm a mom. But during my um, cancer journey, I met young ladies, beautiful young ladies who had been diagnosed and um, did not have that um, option of, you know, um, especially in 
underserved communities, you understand where access to that type of information is um, uh, very difficult, um, especially if you don't have insurance or if you don't have a good multi, you know, disciplinary uh, medical team that can show you the way. So um, I met these ladies and um, a lot of them have gone into menopause at such an early age. So for that lady that is, that will be watching us now and all that, what advice would you give to them as to um, questions or options or whatever about having children prior to or after their cancer treatments? Yeah, thank you so much, Grace. Um, I think I would like to look at this from two points, okay. from the other south areas and the uh, places where medical services are probably done in the right way. Um, I think in places like Nigeria, where sometimes the medical care is fragmented, right? um, and therefore you might be talking to a gynecologist who is not even aware that there is something like fertility preservation. And that's where this actually becomes very handy. The knowledge becomes very handy. Because you could also be asking the doctor about that. Sometimes that's what makes the doctor to start thinking, okay, I'm missing something. Because, you know, the kind of calls I get here, it's like even when finally the doctor wants to refer the patient, the kind of calls I get is, oh, um, yes, I have... Um, I have this patient, I'm scheduling for chemotherapy, um, I'm working out for chemotherapy, I have one week, what can you do? And I said, oh no, very little I can do in one week, okay. So if the, in the first place we can start putting the planning of fertility preservation into the care of people who are diagnosed with cancer, like they will do in the US for example, yes. that will also, that will help a lot, okay. Um, I think the, it's easier for places where, like you said, if you have a multidisciplinary hospital where they can, uh, as they're planning about the cancer care, they're also thinking about the fertility, you know. Mm -hmm. So that might just be a little bit easier, you know. I got a call also from one of the teaching hospitals about a seven-year-old girl, you know, that was diagnosed with cancer. And they, they, fortunately, the doctor was already thinking about our fertility. Mm -hmm. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. So, it, yeah. So, because now we know childhood cancers are doing much better than what they were doing before. Unfortunately, yes. most of the, uh, the therapies will probably render these girls infertile. Over yes. Yes. So, and that's also one a very important aspect of uh, cancer care that we should start thinking of the when these young girls survive the cancer, mm -hmm. that they can still retain their fertility. Mm -hmm. And so that makes it very, 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 very important. Uh, so uh, I think it's a, so anytime I see your crusade or I hear about your crusade, I think I'm always ex excited about it, that somebody should be talking about this, we should bring in this to the fore, and probably also that will help people who are going to go through this struggle. Because yeah. it is a matter of when, it's not if. So um, this, they, they, we have come to live with cancer in the world. And, uh, so for, but there are so many methods now, thankfully, that are available for preserving fertility of women who are going through either if it's breast cancer or some of these childhood cancers. For the childhood cancers, because the majority of these girls are not, have not even reached puberty. Mm -hmm. So it might be the only method that you might be able to have is to conserve part of the ovaries, okay, the real tissue uh, crown preservation might just be the method that you want to uh, apply to such people. But for the young women who probably are not married and also want to preserve their fertility, fortunately also now, we can store eggs. So, yes. yeah, so that's, the, that's from about, from seven years ago or so, we've been able to store eggs. Uh, which was uh, which was uh, experimental in the years of yore, but yeah, uh, yeah for the married people, we could always store embryos. So, uh, but even if you are not married now, you can store your eggs. So mm -hmm. the, 
And there's some other things that we can also, ancillary things that we can do to help such people. Uh, for example, if you are going to go through radiotherapy, uh, it's possible to do a surgery that we call transposition to change the position of the organs. From transposition. Where, transposition. Okay. Change the position of the ovaries to okay. change, take it away from the full blare mm -hmm. of the therapy. Yeah, and then we can also do, they do shielding of the abdomen so that you don't irrigate the ovaries so much. But these are not. Uh, frontline methods, they are probably ancillary methods. Mm -hmm. And also, for people with breast cancer, also, we know that we can give them the other channel, the, your, um, we call it Zoladexia, uh, you call it uh, Lupron in America. It's also possible. That cannot be used alone, but there are things that can also help in uh, prevent. Uh, uh, preserving fertility in this women. So there, there are so many things that are possible now in the yes. moment uh, that are possible for us to use. In yeah. Yes. That's, That's fantastic. And like you rightly said, um, this this information should be available, you know, for people for, for people to actually know that there are options. Uh, to to be able to because I mean if I don't read I don't know so even if my doctor doesn't tell me I'll say I'll go to him and say doctor this is what I read how possible is this to be done that that's why health literacy is very very important for people to actually know that oh maybe the doctor is not telling me something but I've I've heard somewhere I've read somewhere I can bring it to him then he can now start you know maybe calling in one or two other medical professionals to, to help him out, you know, people that are well-versed in, in that area as well, you yeah. know. I guess why, that's why the best doctor now is Dr. Google. <laughs> I tell you, Dr. Google, though. <laughs> you know, Dr. Google is uh, massive, I swear, because <laughs> all sorts of I mean, yes, because I even read your articles, Dr. Jai, on Dr. Google. Your articles <laughs> pop up. And the ones that you haven't told me about, I've already read them. <laughs> <laughs> I had to do my homework before bringing you on. Oh. <laughs> so wonderful. Thank you very much, sir. Thank so um, one thing I know is that in this part of the world where, where I am, um, IVF is very expensive, and I can imagine that it is very expensive everywhere. But thing is that in certain cases, um, they could be covered by insurance, or you have affluent people who, you know, can afford these things. But in your in your case, and you know, definitely you have. Um, patients that have probably, I wouldn't say patients, you know, they're not, they're not ill, um, but clients who would come to, to you to say, oh, they can't afford this, this is very expensive. How do you kind of help alleviate that, that financial burden on them? Uh, because you as a passionate um, infertility expert, you want to see their dreams come true. So how do you help them? Do you help them? Well, thank you, Grace. That's another wonderful question. You see, um, sometimes you are torn between two worlds in the sense that we're in business. And you just painted another scenario that touches on your humanity. So sometimes it's, uh, it's, it's tough. And uh, But the good thing in Africa, again, is that because... Child rearing, child bearing is a, is a premium in this part of the world. So it's not unusual for you to see family members coming together to help somebody in need to uh, fulfill their wishes. Yeah. Uh, also, we also have some programs okay, that we have to be mindful because we also have to pay bills, a lot of bills. Yeah. And people don't even know that it's more expensive to run an IVF clinic in Nigeria than, for example, in, in New York. Yes. Because I have to provide my own power. Uh, I have to provide, I have to import everything that I'm using. It's an industry. 
it's, it's, it's like it's like it, it's like production it's like manufacturing it you have to do everything it's not yourself. right it's not right it, it is. is it is <laughs> that's what i meant to say i'm sorry it is it is yeah. Yeah. so uh, in each of the clinics unfortunately we have three different generating plants wow yeah, you know we need to because power is so important to the to what we're doing so that makes the, the cost also expensive cost of production to be expensive to us yes. now uh, then don't forget again that because we have to import everything that we're using when uh, when and whenever we want to make a purchase from outside nigeria uh, i need to make about 460 naira to one dollar so that also is a killer you know and people don't see they don't understand all that and so uh, but still you live among people you live with people who sometimes cannot afford anything and there is no really there is no insurance company that now is going through that hog with anybody so it's like a personal cross in this part of the world you have to bear it all on your own mm -hmm. Every, almost everything is paid out of pocket so that we also understand that so we clinics now have to come with some ingenious ways to see how people can uh, afford this so one of the things that we have done in my clinic is apart from giving free IVF clinic, uh, treatment sometimes uh, when we can uh, collaborating with some other people who have like minds mm -hmm. we also do what we call the um, flexi pay where we can say you can pay over a period of one year flexi pay right flexi pay, yeah. okay so, i need i need to put that in my notes so that um <laughs> when i'm talking about this they know that that yeah. is that comes yeah. in oh that's great so Nordica flexi pay. yeah so you can pay over one year uh once you've started the, the process mm -hmm. any price increase would not affect you and you can pay over one year so we we're, we're also doing we're doing something like that. But also there are some banks, financial institutions that are also giving some loans with very uh, low interest rate now for the treatment of infertility. So those are some of the things that. And then we have one here and there. Okay, like uh, we 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 involved with um, uh, Itwa, uh, uh, Igodalo, Igodalo, mm -hmm. who just. Uh, for mm. uh, then they said she was going to give 40 people free mm. IVFs. So we are also involved with that. So we try to see people with like minds and then try to see how we can make life easier for the people. Because right now we know that uh, it might be difficult for government to be able to take this on. So the appeal would just probably be to see, uh, you know, and then one of the Days of healthcare in this part of the world is that it's left for doctors to sort out. Mm -hmm. You know, uh -huh. but what I say that healthcare is more than what doctors can sort out. Just like it's an industry, okay? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And then when there's something that an industry, some people need to be able to invest in it, but they, it needs to be able to, the return on investment needs to be able to make sense to them and, and so on and so forth. I think mean, that it, healthcare is just. Um, a, a, a diamond in the mud in this part of the world that needs to be discovered. So we, I think over time, we're going to get there. By the grace of God, I hope so. Because, um, you know, I, I see our budget for healthcare go down gradually in Nigeria. I mean, before it used to be tops. At, at, at that time, it was, it was important. It was at, at the top um, of the list. But now I, I don't know what's going on, you know, when we had, um, I'm sorry to say, but these things have to be said when we had real, you know, professionals at the helm of affairs, you know, that actually knew and, and, and know exactly how the poor man was suffering as regards health care. But like you said, we keep our fingers crossed. We, we will get there. We will get there, I'm sure. We'll get there. Yeah, I think you touch a very important point about, uh, you know, uh, the African countries met and decided that 50% of the GDP should be allocated to healthcare. Uh, 
um, Nigeria is doing less than 4% now. So, uh, because now most African countries uh, depend on uh, financial assistance for their healthcare, and that cannot work. Uh, so, and that's why healthcare is suffering. But if you ask me, I think it's also a wonderful opportunity for investors mm. to invest in uh, this part of the world. See, it's like telecoms. It's an industry. It's like telecoms. It is. You know, when telecoms first came into Nigeria, many people, many companies did not, they missed out on it. Because they were looking at the difficulties. It was And they were looking at short term, you know, they weren't even looking at the bigger picture. No, they were not. It was only you can see the companies that braved it. See what they Nigeria is the biggest mine to them now. So um it's the same thing. That's the same thing that's gonna to happen to healthcare. When finally some people are able to uh, brave it and come around, then they will be asking the, themselves, why did they not see this 10 years ago? Mm-hmm. So we, we just keep our fingers crossed, just like you said, but I think it's something that is waiting, but it should be done properly. And like you said again, um, we should look at the long-term effect, not the short-term. Yes, and that's sir. what many people investing in Africa are beginning to realize now, that if you want to invest in Africa, don't call for the short haul. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Nothing is uh, short in Africa. <laughs> No, no, no. <laughs> this is not a, you have to really wait and see returns. No, it's, not, it's not microwave. It's not microwave. Oh. It's not <laughs> microwave. You have to boil it forever. <laughs> honestly, honestly. Um, that, that is, um, it's something that one, healthcare, healthcare. I've always been fanatical about healthcare, even before, um, you know, my cancer journey and all that you know especially women living with uterine fibroids and having to undergo all that and you know um and deceiving themselves that they were pregnant to even their their spouses you know trying to cover up that's where the culture comes in and and all that so um but but they say um sister grace you know how much this thing is now i got a manager I go, they go. I go, they manage them. I go, they go. But you're bleeding to death. So these are things that um, we honestly need well, to... Now that you mentioned the time fibroids, you know, we're, we're, there is a, we're bringing something in now. We're actually in January that okay. you will not to do surgery to treat your time fibroids. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Uh, Dr. Cool. Jai, you, you have to tell me more about that so I can... Yeah. Yeah, it's called high intensity frequency ultrasound. So it's okay. um, it's um, like burning off the fibroids. Okay. And then um, yeah, no scar, nothing at all. Oh, fantastic, fantastic! Because um, so that is done internally, right? It'll be like a high frequency thing. It, will, will will it have like a probe to do that? No. Oh, yeah, it it's a probe. It's placed on your abdomen. It's not. It's, just oh, it's not internal. Abdomen. No, 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 no. Seriously? That's fantastic. Yeah, it, it's wonderful. Oh, wow. Okay, we'll talk more about that. <laughs> we'll talk more about that. So, um, I, I forgot to ask you, when going through this um, IVF process, are there any side effects that, you know, one should watch out for? Yes, I, I, I think, yeah. Fortunately, it's getting less now. The greatest problem with um, IVF is the drugs that we, gonna, we use for mm-hmm. to bring out the eggs, just like we said that you need to produce many eggs. Sometimes mm-hmm. this, this uh, eggs really become uh, problematic in that they, they produce too many eggs, what we call hyperstimulation. And that probably is the only thing that can, uh, that is really dangerous in IVF. Oh, really? Uh, Yes, wow. but right now, we now have um, protocols that reduce the incidence. For example, uh, in the last eight years, I don't think I've had any uh, hyper stimulation that will require hospitalization. Oh, and uh, so, because that's what we, we use that regimen more than any other. Mm-hmm. 
So hyperstimulation is the greatest threat. So the other things are like, okay, during the process, maybe you can put your needle in the wrong place. That's also, that's a very rare thing. Maybe one in 1,000 women. So that's really happens. And okay. The training can uh, always do uh, mitigate that. So the, the, those are some of the, 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 the complications that can arise from IVF. Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. So, um, okay, for, for example, I, I, I come to you and all that, and the process has not been successful, and I want to go through it again. Mm. Is, it, is it necessary? Is it possible? And if it's possible, what is the, what's the gap? What is the time frame to be able to start all over? Um, yes, now, especially now with the uh, regime that I told you that we mm-hmm. can, that can prevent hyperstimulation, you can, always, you can do back-to-back if you're ready. Oh, so really? You can, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can, the next month you can do okay. if you're psychologically ready. So the most important thing is, are you set for it? Mm. So now, yeah, we can, you can do back-to-back. You can take some months off. It depends. So there's no tailor-made answer for this. So we have to look at the individual. And some people just say, you know what? I just want to take a break. Yes. And that's, that's respected. Yes. And yes, and uh, like you rightly said, um, they have to be mentally ready because it's, a, it's a, you, you say two to four weeks, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a crazy process. It's forever. To... It's forever. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's um, mm, having to go through, and then expectations are high, and then when mm. nothing comes out of it, you know, the disappointment and having to, and then also, um, the lady is now scared that, oh, maybe it's going to be the same. So a lot of them, mm. like, fall off the bandwagon and say, no, I'm not going to go through that, um, because they're scared to you know, fail at it again, you know. So that's where your, your, your coaches and medical, t- uh, mental health team have to, um, you know, give them hope too, to say, listen, it doesn't mean because you failed this time, or not that you failed, but it, it didn't mm-hmm. go through. Um, yeah. You can always uh, repeat it, you know. Mm. Correct, that's right, yeah. Actually, that's the greatest problem in IVF. And uh, sometimes that also what stands between us and success. Mm. Because success rate in IVF is cumulative. Um, very few people do only one cycle and it's successful. So you probably need to do two, three cycles. And you see some people, <laughs> after one, they just say, no more. You know? It takes them another two years to come back. And one thing again is that success rate is age dependent. So you are reducing your success rate again. So it's, it's a lot, and that's why it's so important for the people who are going to go through the process to understand the implication of every decision that they're going to make. So that you can know, okay, you know what, I'm bracing myself for two, three cycles. Mm-hmm. And here we are, we're going to go through it. Um, if possible, I'm going to take two months break if it fails before I do another one. So I'm going to take only one more. Plan almost everything. And then, then also, that's when you can also use the support that the clinics have to take you through this period. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, in Nigeria, um, counseling is something that we, that is a little bit foreign. Uh, the kind of counseling we're used to is the church counseling. You know, the pastor say, is the one who tells you what to do. That's mm-hmm. not counseling. At all. <laughs> At all. You tell him the problem, he tells you what to do. So they come to the clinic expecting the same thing. Yeah. And but that's not counseling. You are supposed to come with the solution. The counselor is to listen to you, guide you, bring out the solution that is tailor made for you and by you. Mm-hmm. And so they, they fail to understand that. And so they are expecting the counselor to just tell them, Oh, this is what you should do, this is what you should do. It, no, it doesn't it, it doesn't work that way so um and that also makes us not to utilize the counselor properly uh, but of course we are getting there we, we we are better than what we were 15 years ago absolutely we're, we're getting there it's not it's not um you know we just have to take our time everything has its um 
you know, as they say, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. Um, Nicely. It, it, it takes time to, to get these things done, you mm. know, yeah. Dr. Jai, this has been such a wonderful, I could go on and on, but I know that you're up for time. <laughs> so you are exceptionally busy. Um, you're all over the place, philanthropist, writer, academician, all sorts of things. Where do you find the time to remain grounded? How do you find time for yourself and family? What do you do? Okay. The funny thing now is that... Um, I suddenly discovered my house is a, a very comfortable place. Mm -hmm. So I spend most of my time now, if I'm not in the office, I'm at home. Because now also, most of my exercise is doing aerobics, mm -hmm. which can be done indoors. You know? yeah. So, And that also makes me to, and I of course love watching soccer. So, <laughs> so that's the, and that's um, the way I just spend my every day. If I'm, once I'm at home, I mean, I've, I've not traveled with Corona. Oh, and this year has been special. Oh, I just, special. <laughs> remember, I cannot remember the last time I spent so much time at home. Yes. And, yeah, yeah, I know. And, it's, it's, been, it's been great. It's been fun. You so, now know all the four corners. You're now discovering places that... <laughs> Even things I don't want to know about. You have to know by force. You're indoors. <laughs> uh, that's so nice, Dr. J. Oh, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. It's been such a wonderful discussion with you. So, if you had to go down this path again, would you? Hmm. Yes, maybe from with probably one modification. Okay, and that's what is making me to do some things now. Um, I started my life as a doctor. Okay, I'm no longer a doctor, not just a doctor. I'm now an entrepreneur. Okay, um, and uh, I wish I'd done that when I was much younger. And that's what I think I owe this uh, present generation of mm. young doctors to be able to add leadership and entrepreneurship to them at a very young age. And that's what's giving birth to what I sent to you this morning. The, yes. my, the mentoring. The mentoring program. That's essentially what I'm trying to do with the young doctors now. It's beautiful. Yeah, doctors have a wonderful opportunity. You know? they, 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 they are gifted, they are everything, but we are financial illiterates. So it's better that you add financial literacy to them before they really start making money or something. And then also how they can see opportunities. You see, I wonder why doctors, everybody wants to go to Canada, everybody wants to go to the UK, everybody wants to go to the US. It's not wise, seriously. There's so many opportunities in this part of the world. You just need to open your eyes. You just need to understand that every problem presents an opportunity. Yes. How do you make, turn down that problem to an opportunity? That's the way we should allow the doctors to start thinking. And that is entrepreneurship, part of entrepreneurship. And so that's what I wish I'd garnered a long time ago. And that's what I think I owe to the younger doctors. Yes. To be able to allow them to see that they, they're sitting, majority of them are sitting on gold, but they're looking for brass somewhere else. That's a very powerful way of giving back, Dr. Ajayi, honestly. May God continue to take care of you and open your heart. You've done amazingly well, um, you. you know, putting, doing all that you do, in fact. I know you don't want to say too much, but... <laughs> We know who you are and we know what you do. So um, I really appreciate you coming on the show, Dr. Jai. Um, God bless you for all you do. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much, much for supporting Cancer Convos with Grace B. My pleasure. You're doing, you're doing a wonderful job too. Thank and, you, sir. Yeah, Thank you. The good Lord will continue to give you good health and strengthen you. 
Amen. Thank you so much for your prayers. Thank you. So before I sign you out, let me say my outro. Okay. So my dear audience and friends, there you have it. You have been listening to the amazing Dr. Abayomi Ajayi, the MD CEO of Nordica Fertility Center in Lagos, Nigeria. When I post this video, you're going to have all the information um, necessary for those who would like to know more about what he does and um, where to go to if they're having any infertility issues. Now, as I always say at the end, don't forget to like, subscribe, and share this channel so that you know that knowledge is power and health is wealth. Thank you guys for always being here for us. Thank you. This is Grace B signing out. Dr. Jai, God bless you. Thank you ever so much. My pleasure. My pleasure. It's really been wonderful being with you. Thank you, sir. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.